Hello, everybody. Hi, Andrea. Hello. Hi, Andrea. How are you? It's been a long time. <laughs> I sent you an email not that long ago, but maybe it went to your, didn't go to your main inbox. Did you see it? I'm sorry. Hey, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's not the one about voting, right? No, no, it was something else. No, it was something else. I can send it okay. again. I will look for it. I'm okay. sure I receive it and I, I was full of things. I okay, I will look for it. Is is are we still on time for whatever? Yeah, there's still it's still relevant. So just look out for an okay. email from okay. me. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jenny. No Sorry. No problem. All right. Uh, is there anybody else at the door, Matt? Uh, nope. All right. So I'm going to quickly share the agenda just for reference in the chat. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for joining us uh, today. We're already in June, uh, which is, you know, great and sunny weather and see the end of the end uh, of the COVID tunnel, at least, at least in, uh, in New York. So uh, this is nice. And we have uh, uh, two main things today. We have our special guest, uh, Kevin, uh, from Gitcoin, uh, who's going to talk about the recent uh, development with Quadratic Lens and uh, and um, their governance token. And I'm fully swagged, Kevin. Look. Ta-da! Quadratic Lens. Oh, wow. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, and uh, and then uh, and then we're uh, also gonna uh, talk about uh, Pride Month because it just started uh, yesterday, and um, uh, to highlight a few uh, a few things and uh, and and start some discussions about uh, work related to the LGBT. QIA uh, community. So uh, as usual, uh, before we give the floor to Kevin, I wanted to ask if there are any newcomer uh, to, the, uh, to the call uh, and if they want to introduce themselves or uh, just say hi in the, in the chat. All right, we have like, the useful is the used crowd, so great. Uh, oh, well, I, 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 <laughs> oh, Anna, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't see your hand on video. Hi, just wanted to say hi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, welcome, welcome. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I wanted to, um, which I um, Angela told me last time. I always forget to introduce the team. Uh, so I'm actually gonna uh, do that for once, uh, and uh, and just to mention that uh, we have uh, Glenn, the founder of uh, Radical Exchange, uh, here today. Uh, we have uh, Matt and Jen, who are uh, co-director of the foundation. We also have uh, Angela, uh, with um, our great chapter lead, uh, Leon, uh, with a technology lead. Uh, Alex uh, Randaccio, who is uh, also on the side of technology and the lead of Radical Exchange Voice uh, that we, we hear about uh, as well. Uh, and Eli uh, was also crazily enough uh, for the first time on the community call, but was done a great job uh, with the community uh, and Radical Exchange. And, uh, and myself, uh, who we'll, was we'll here. Um, so <laughs> hopefully you know me by now. Uh, so without further ado, um, uh, except if Matt, Jen, or Glenn, or anybody else from the team want to say uh, anything, we're going to go to Just, Kevin. Uh, hello, I'm Andrea, and hi, Joel, as well. This is your first time. Pleasure to have you. Very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, awesome. So. Um, uh, if you are um, uh, involved a little bit with a uh, more like blockchain governance or uh, or uh, follow a little bit Gitcoin, you probably have seen um, the launch of uh, their new governance uh, token uh, last week, along with uh, a broader initiative like Quadratic Lens. Uh, but I 
Um, and I'm sure uh, as myself, you might want to hear more and we're happy to have Kevin, a long time Radical Exchange uh, friend uh, today to uh, tell us a bit more about it. And if you have questions, don't hesitate. So Kevin, it's all yours. Thanks so, thanks so much, Fanny. Um, and then you said, I think 10 minutes is what I should aim for ish, right? I'll try to do like maybe like six or seven and then we can discuss. I, I feel like discussion is always more fun than me talking. Um, so the uh, the talk that oh I can't I can't share my screen um, but uh, we're going to give you the power. Okay, cool. I have the power. I got the power. So so um, basically, uh, Gitcoin recently launched Gitcoin DAO, and I wanted to talk a little bit about that today. Or I guess I was invited to talk a little bit about that today. And it's really special to be giving a presentation to the Radical Exchange community because I think that. Um, a lot of the reasons why Gitcoin has been able to have an impact on our mission, which is our mission is to grow and sustain open source software. We believe that open source software is a public good, provides $500 billion per year in economic value to the world, and there's no business model for open source software. Um, one of the really amazing things about, uh, about Radical Exchange is that y'all are prototyping new economic concepts that uh, can use markets for new and sometimes more altruistic things. And uh, it's really exciting to be taking the ideas straight out of Vitalik and Glenn's brain and putting a shiny neon interface on them so that the world can interact with them. It's been a great, great marriage of, uh, of, of communities. Um, I still can't share my screen, Fanny. I can just talk to it, but I have shiny objects I could show if- I, mean, I think Matt, uh, you have to give a, I, I can't give a- bow. Cool. <clears throat> so oh, you, can know. you should be good cool i have uh i have i have the power now thank you so um basically if you have not heard of gitcoin the primary uh point of intersection that we have with the radical exchange community right now is with this thing called quadratic funding so basically vitalik and glenn and zoe wrote this paper called constrained capital liberal radicalism a couple years ago and gitcoin has taken it and we're now funding open source software on a product called Gitcoin Grants using it. We've funded about $10 million worth of open source software in the Ethereum ecosystem in uh, with quadratic funding. And uh, also shout out CLR Fund. I think Aryan's in the, in the audience and is also working on quadratic funding in the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, we are deploying quadratic funding not only on Gitcoin Grants to the Ethereum ecosystem, along with CLR fund, but we've done experiments with taking quadratic funding mainstream. Uh, we ran an experiment using quadratic funding for economic recovery with COVID in downtown Boulder, Colorado last year. Um, we are about to launch a Web2 quadratic funding experiment in partnership with Open Collective next week. So keep a, a, an eye out for fundoss.org, which launches next week. And I'm also in talks with the governors of Colorado and Nebraska about bringing quadratic funding to their local environments. So we are taking quadratic funding and trying to put it in all the places. And what we're really trying to do is build up a, a vessel to go to the quadratic lands. Basically this mythical place where public goods are well-funded and we have more digital democracy is our vision of this promised land where, where we think that there's, there's a more optimistic version of, of, of humanity on the other on the other side of it, and it's because we're funding things that create value, not just things that can capture value, and and that's what quadratic funding allows us to do. And one of the things that I guess like maybe not everyone knows about me in the radical exchange group is that like maybe twenty percent of my time is spent on product and building Gitcoin grants. I actually, as like the CEO of of Gitcoin Holdings, this this company, have to spend a lot of time thinking about how do I pay salaries and like how do I fund the company, which um, is a real pain in the butt. Because I have been the, a founder of web startups for the last 10 or 15 years. And I know basically how the game works. You build a prototype, you go to Sand Hill Road, you basically pitch it to these VCs. And what, what has emerged, and this is an idea from Chris Dixon, is that basically what you're trying to do is hit this network effect where at first you're trying to attract users to your platform. And over time you hit this network effect where every person who joins your network makes the network better for everyone else. And eventually it becomes this self-propagating machine and you're, you're growing a lot. Um, and basically these Web2 platforms, I know because I've been a Web2 founder before, move from attracting users to extracting from them. 
from basically like lording over them and extracting from them. And, and I think that that's a problem because the consent of the governed is the only foundation for legitimate, for legitimate governance of, of a community. You have to have the consent of the people that you governed. And I just didn't want to do that with Gitcoin. Um, we have now hit a point in which we are providing lots of funding to open source software developers. And I want to move to a vessel where we can move from attracting users to hitting a network effect to eventually in enabling users. And the way that 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 I see that we can have the consent of the governed in Web3 is to give the users a piece of the platform to govern it themselves. Themselves. So basically, tokenized governance can allow us to create web scale cooperatives um, that where users become governors, um, enabling in managers to have aligned incentives. So basically, in my old Web2 company, I ran an online dating website when I was like 24. Ask me about it sometime. It was a fun experience in my 20s. But basically, I had the VCs on one side of me saying, take the users and extract as much money from them as possible. Um, and I didn't want to do that again with Gitcoin. And so what we did was we released a governance token. And now the people who have funded grants, funded public goods on Gitcoin are now in charge of making the decisions of what Gitcoin does um, and what does governance on Gitcoin grants look like. And by the way, I have governance problems coming out of the ears right now. Um, still trying to figure out civil resistance and fraud resistance, which is maybe something that CLR Fund and I can, can jam on over the long term. But um, basically what we ended up doing was we uh, launched the quadraticlands.com last week, and we made users go through a proof of knowledge, which is basically proving that they understand why open source is important. Proof of use, which is basically uh, using their governance tokens to vote on like a dummy governance thing. Um, and then proof of receive, which is when they actually get a GTC token, which is their share of governance in the Gitcoin network. Um, and, and basically one of the things that we did was we made people delegate to members of the Gitcoin community as they got their tokens. And this is, this is what the governors, I guess like the equivalent of senators looks like in the Gitcoin ecosystem now. So we've got Trent from the EF, we've got Austin Griffith, we've got uh, Linda, who's a prominent Ethereum community member. Um, and, and, and basically these are the people who have the consent of the governed uh, because they had the people who, the people who were redeeming their GTC tokens could set who they wanted to vote on their behalf or they could self-delegate if they care to follow governance. Not a lot of people have time for it. Um, and these are the people who are making decisions about what to do with the treasury. So we've got about $5 million. I don't know if you all know this, but crypto is volatile. Right now we have $5 million worth of ETH. We have $500 million of these dog tokens that Vitalik donated to us. They're probably not worth $5 million, $500 million, but they were at some point. Um, and we have 50 million GTC tokens, which have no economic value. Um, and so basically now uh, we have this governance system where these delegates can create proposals um, they will be active in voting for three days. If the voting ends and they are defeated, then the proposal dies. If the voting ends and uh, is succeeded, then it is queued in a time lock in which it can be executed in two days. And basically a proposal can be any smart contract function on the Ethereum blockchain, including moving the 500 million tokens that are in the Gitcoin DAO's treasury from point A to B. So basically governance now has the reign, like I have no control of this over this treasury. The DAO has control of this treasury. The consent of the governed is imbued in the immutable transparent blockchain state of the system. And so this is the starting point. People keep congratulating me for launching Gitcoin DAO. And I'm like, hey, this is the starting point. Like we're gonna fund more public goods this way. And like, this is really just the beginning of the end game, which is how do we fund public goods at scale? How do we go to the quadratic lands is kind of what I'm focused on right now. And um, yeah, that's that's my YOLO presentation uh, or what I was able to put together after Fanny asked me to, to come here and speak about it. So um, I don't know how blockchain native people are in the audience. Hopefully I didn't go too fast for everyone, but would love to open it up to discussion and talk about Gitcoin DAO and how we're going to fund more things with quadratic funding in the future with Gitcoin DAO and CLR funds. Thank you. Uh, it was really a, a lot of content and, uh, and, and, and thank you for making the um totally. the, the the presentation in, on, on social short notice it is uh, it is quite inspiring uh, to see uh implementation and 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 hearing the reasoning uh from you also really helps um you know like more often than um than i would like it to be like you just see technical um you know DAOs popping up but then no real 
um, focus on the on the why, like really just mm -hmm. on the how. Uh, so, uh, so I, I had a question uh, to start. If uh, uh, you mentioned that like this treasury now is the hand is in the hand of the DAO, like have you um, like and I know it just started, but um, how do you reconcile like uh, small tasks like paying salaries and mm -hmm. this like big complex uh, DAO um, you know system that um, is great. I, I would like to hear from you like how you see the theory and the reality yeah. kind of um, come together. Totally. So um, Gitcoin DAO is a fork of Uniswap's governance, which is basically a battle tested security forked or security audited version of Ethereum governance that allows for liquid democracy. Our like small way of pushing forward Ethereum governance was having people delegate before they um, before they receive their tokens, and therefore we have more consent of the governed imbued in the base layer, at, like the starting point of the DAO, because everyone who has tokens has delegated, as opposed to like previous versions of this governance, like basically anyone who's who's remembered to do it, which is like 3% of people have um, have delegated. So like that was our way of pushing DAOs forward. Um, right now, Fanny, like hand to the sky, like Gitcoin is is centralized. Like we have we have like a company that runs the product and the platform right now. And we've actually spun up a work stream to decentralize Gitcoin and our tech stack. And that means, you know, how do we store the data in IPFS or a credibly neutral place? How do we store the code in a credibly neutral place? And, and you know, how can the stewards have, have a watchful eye over it in order to make sure that the company is actually serving the needs of the community are things that we're working on right now. And, and idea, ideally, like in my mind's eye it's really up to the up to the community uh we'll dissolve the company one day and it'll all just be run through the dow but in between that vision and where we are now there's a lot of you know like big question marks in between uh in between those things like right now you need to hit a threshold of one percent to get a proposal live uh and 2.5 percent of of the tokens need to vote for something to to get it passed and like for just like hiring someone that's that's really a, a big barrier and so i think that we're going to need some sort of shim for em employment in in a daoized world shim just means basically like taking one interface and making it look a little bit more like something else it's like a computer computer term mm -hmm. um so i guess fanny the tldr is that we don't really actually know but we're trying to invent it right now and we're eating our own dog food as we do it um the one thing that gitcoin has going for it is 150,000 software engineers that like, oh, we want to do an experiment. We have people that can build it and we have coins that we can pay them. So we can hopefully iterate faster than than a lot of other DAOs because, because that's that's who we are. We fund open source software developers and open source software developers are going to build this. So uh, mm -hmm. that's a long way of saying we're still figuring it out. No, no, no. This is a, this is a great experiment, uh, definitely. Sami, you had a, a few questions if you... Uh, uh... Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so Kevin, my question was that uh, I've seen a lot of models in the crypto space with how DAOs are taking in proposals and all of that looks really good. The intentions are set in place, um, but we do not have the sort of general intelligence which will execute those proposals, right? Because they're still implemented by the team, in which mm -hmm. case there's always gray areas. Uh, and I know yeah. right now uh, we're not there yet, yeah. but what would it look like when we are there? Uh, is there some sort of general mm -hmm. machine intelligence which can execute proposals or implementation? Right. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's like governance problems the whole way down. <laughs> uh, who do you trust? You know, what is the what is the way through which we distribute tokens? Um, so, so um, up until now, basically, the governance stack had been a snapshot and and gnosis safe, which is basically like a vote happens on snapshot. And then it's up to the Gnosis safe holders to interpret that and to actually execute it. With compound governance, the proposers are actually hooked up in an immutable blockchain where there is no core team that is in charge of deciding what gets executed or not. Like you're actually proposing a smart contract function that will be executed if the propo proposal passes. Um, and you know, 
the real hard problem is that like, say we're going to transfer a million dollars worth of Ethereum to another address as part of the proposal. Well, what's the trust model of the address that you're sending the tokens to in, in this model? Um, you know, is it is it trustlessness all the way to the end final resting place for those tokens? Or is there a core team on the other side of that that you're going to have to trust uh, and hold accountable for executing those, those tokens? And I think that... Um, Governance, yeah, governance is an unsolved problem. Um, one of the things that I really like is that on Gitcoin grants, we now have this credible, credibly neutral mechanism for distributing tokens to a wide swath of people according to what a community values. And you know, our, our, our I think that most of the proposals in Gitcoin DAO are going to go to a smart contract that just gives tokens to the results of the Gitcoin grants experiment. And so it's it's mostly trustless as it goes along that way, but um. I think Aryan and CLR Fund are actually ahead of us, us on on this in in having it be more trustful. Trustful. So, um, yeah, we're still figuring it out. I guess is the TLDR. Gwen, you had a question. Yeah, I, I just wanted to push back a little bit on the framing of that last question because, I, look at at some level, um, if everything is executed automatically down to the level of like picking up the pencil. And mm -hmm. like, you know, you're, you were supposed to write this out on this sheet of paper for this person. You've like literally achieved the worst possible dystopia of human replacement. Mm -hmm. So like mm -hmm. there, ha there has to be some balance where you're adding legitimacy um, to things that you think are problematically discretionary in a concentrated way without eliminating all pluralistic human participation from the process. So like what you really don't want is the like AI maximalist replace all the people vision to creep into something that was meant to be decentralized. You see what I mean? So like, I don't think that the answer to decentralization is that there is some mechanical voting process that governs everything. It has to be some balance among these things. And so I actually think the challenges that Kevin's working through are like good things, like features, not bugs, and that's not, you know, but. Totally. It's, it's nice to get a pushback. Like I spent so much time in the Ethereum space where everything has to be totally trustless. And it's, it's interesting to get, to get that kind of feedback. Um, yeah, I think that's a fair point, Glenn. Um, there's also Amit uh, who posted uh, um, some questions about the um, like conceptual and philosophical discussions behind DAOs. Um, uh, Amit, do you want to tell it in person? All right, so I can uh, I can read uh, uh, the mm -hmm. the question like being really the um, like that we need to have like conception of DAOs. Um, need to have a philosophical discussion as well as, well as a technical one. If it's going to be a representation of human being and digital metaverse, the DAO community needs to think about what constitutes human and how to translate all of our thought, which we represent ourselves with and with, which makes us us. Can work mm -hmm. as all of us as individual and member of Bioverse. Of course, the Bioverse doesn't let us fully represent us yet. And the, the difference between what's in our mind and how it can be represented to other causes a lot of mental anxiety in individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it goes back to like what Orin is saying, like humans, or like, right. that goes against actually, like humans at the center or at the edge versus the code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's really interesting to me about uh, quadratic funding is that it really takes the pref like basically what Gitcoin's trying to do is build a, a, a preference expression engine for humanity to express what's important to them through their own decisions about what they fund. And then quadratic funding is a way of aggregating that and figuring out how to allocate a central matching pool according to the preferences of the edge of the network, as opposed to like some central grant administrator. Be curious if Glenn agrees with my framing of quadratic funding here. But um, you know, I think that that aggregation of the human expression and the in the preferences is sort of at the heart of what quadratic funding is for me. And and for that reason, I feel like it leverages the sort of human, like the human input and the community needs um, in a in an efficient way. But I'd be curious if economists like I, I'm just like a I mean, hipster who puts me on interfaces on stuff. I'd be curious. I, I agree a lot with what Kevin is saying. I think that the key thing to remember here, though, is that all these things are tools to be used by people to solve mm -hmm. problems 
of real concern about concentrated power in particular places. Mm -hmm. They're not like solutions to the problems of the world on their own in a completely context, you know, detached way. Like, it, it's not like a DAO or some set of rules is just going to be the rules. And then that's just going to like, if we make that completely autonomous and nobody involved, that's just going to create justice. Like, th there are real reasons to be concerned about grant makers. There's real reasons to be concerned about governments directing funds to media, for example. And like, these are real things that people worry about. Those should be addressed using these mechanisms where we're concerned about that. But on the other hand, when there's like, I don't think it's like a major concern to the world that like a factory worker has the discretion to choose whether like this thing is broken or not and therefore needs to fix it. Like I actually think we think that that empowerment is good empowerment and that's actually decentralizing empowerment. And that's not something we'd like to replace with like a DAO that then like forces them to do exactly X action that's surveilled from above. So like, I just think we need to keep that in mind and like use these things for our human purposes to empower us rather than as our masters because they have some like theoretical properties. Yeah, there is definitely the the um, cult of the DAO, right? Like thinking, oh, we 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 want the DAO because it's cool and sounds magical, uh, but but really seeing if it fits the purpose. I think this is something that. Uh, even for the foundation like that Matt and Jen have really uh, thought about. Um, I don't know if Matt or Jen, you wanna mention something? Well, I had a conversation this morning that was where I was saying exactly what Glenn just said that, you know, the, we're thinking about our goals are to, you know, increase equality and make life better for everybody. And, um, you know, as, as an individual and what we try to do in, radical exchange and throughout lots of things that we do and that these are tools there are tools that we can use and technologies that we can use and markets that we could look at to to persuade or influence or in that way to make things better but i, com I just completely agree with what glenn said it's not about the technology or you know the DAO or the blockchain or you know this yeah. very specific thing. It's really about like what are we what are we trying to achieve as humans? I think that's totally true. And and I just want to interject that like I'm a software engineer, so I might talk like a software engineer a lot. Um, but I really think that the undiscovered greenfield space here is governance. All I know right now is that I don't want to go down the web two Silicon Valley path. Yeah. Um, and that's great. Like yeah. There, there's a there's a well-trodden path where like you build a SaaS business, you get enough people to subscribe at ten dollars a month, and then you sell it to Google. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that I don't want to do that, but there's this whole greenfield undiscovered space for DAOs, and like it's basically up to us to invent the new model for entrepreneur activism that doesn't sell out to Silicon Valley, that exits to community maybe, or ju or just runs it forever as a community good. And yeah. I think we're trying to discover what that model is right now. Yeah. And that's super important. Your, your big goal is not to have this concentration of wealth and power that just extracts from people. And you're doing all these other things that incorporates governance, that incorporates how do we make decisions together? How do we work together? How do we make things less, you know, just everything goes to a monopoly basically in the end. So, yeah, I, mean, I, so I, I, I think one thing I would really emphasize is like, there's two different visions of like, change and, and, and decentralization. One is which I would call subtractive and the other is additive. The subtractive vision is we're like, all the institutions suck, let's wipe it all away. And we're gonna have like one thing that's gonna like solve all the problems, you know what I mean? And like there's certain versions of DAO or Bitcoin fundamentalism that like have that feeling to them. And like, I will bet dollars to donuts to anyone that any system that's built on that sort of thing is gonna end up more centralized than whatever it's replacing. And like we have enormous amounts of evidence from the Bitcoin world that that's true. There's going to be more evidence coming out. There's lots of research going on on this. Um, the, the additive one says, no, like we actually need to build new tools as a way to spread and include more of the things that already exist and to like, you know, incorporate them and bridge across them in a way that allows for more pluralism. And like, that's the way that the internet came into being. It was not some like hacker dude just like blowing everything up. It was actually a multi-stakeholder cooperation among existing groups that allowed for that diversification. So I just think it's like really important to keep in mind that we like 
don't just try to wipe everything away and replace it with the perfect system, but actually like incorporate. And, and by the way, I think Gitcoin's done a great job of doing that, but there's a temptation in the blockchain to go in the opposite direction. I would just interject, Glenn, um, I'm saber rattling right now to get quadratic voting at the base layer of the DAO. So it's not just one-to-one -one token voting to pass proposals, it's quadratic vote. We just have, all we got to do is solve civil resistance and then we can do it. <laughs> One thing that, that I would add is I, I think it's it's really useful actually to understand some of this stuff in historical context because like, yeah, so I, I would underline the point that it's just governance problems all the way down and it kind of already has been, always has been. So you, I mean, if you look at history, if you look at all the technological revolutions that have happened hundreds of years ago and thousands of years ago, they've all allowed people to organize in new ways and at larger scale. And every time people have become able to organize in new ways and at larger scale, new governance problems have arisen, right? And so that this is how we've, you know, and in, in, in the face of those challenges, things like uh, constitutional governance have, have in, and democracy have, have arisen, right? Like, you know, when, once, society became industrial, the idea that like one king would have all the power became even more horrifying than it was before. So, you know, the imperative for democracy got even stronger. We're in, we're in a situation like that now where we need, to, we need to work at the edge of governance and figure out better ways of, of taking collective decisions in like a different technological context. So we may not, you know, it's, it's not surprising that, that uh, we don't have the perfect answers. Like we never have and we never will but we're all kind of working together to try to figure out uh, how to get there. Um, I think uh, Christina had the question or her hand raised for a while. Just want to be mindful. Yeah, so um, I, I became interested in this um, as, a, as a way to solve a problem. So just as some background, I work for a, a dev shop. So I'm sure many of you know developers, there's the end goal, build the product, but along the way, there's a bunch of user stories or whatever, and then you give them they have to be written, then they get an estimate, and then somebody decides we're good with this, let's continue, or we should split this, or we should combine these two, or actually that's a bug. Um, so when these and when these proposals happen, like how does it, there's agreement of like, yes, I like the proposal, and then I'm assuming there's some sort of cost to implement it, right? Because money isn't free. Um, like, how do you? Like when you're doing the work of act of doing this, how do you say this is a great proposal, but that one detail there is like insane. If we remove mm -hmm. it, then the cost makes sense. Yeah. If we keep it in, then the answer is no. How do you keep on having like a, like an infinite number of variations of different cost text combinations when what you really want to do is like, well, we'll just take out this part that we're arguing about and we'll keep the parts that we know are sane and we we'll agree on the price or whatever the cost is and continue. Like how do you how do you deal with that practically as a as a business that happens to be distributed? Totally, um, I feel like we need like the crypto equivalent of how a bill becomes a law, like a schoolhouse rock video or something. Because, um, uh, but the actual answer to your question is is that there's a threshold uh, through which you have to get to two point five percent of the votes in order to have a proposal pass. And typically what you'll see is that there's the actual governance system and then there's a social layer built on top of that. In the case of Gitcoin, it's at gov.gitcoin.co. And if a proposal fails to pass, then it can be resubmitted with different parameters. You know, if some, if one of them was rejected, go ahead. What if there's like two estimates of here's uh, like, we're building a car and then there's a person that's like, we should buy the tires from this tire wholesaler. And then the other mm -hmm. one is like the car, should, the, car, the wheel should just be part of it. They should just come with it. I don't want it without the wheels. Um, mm -hmm. So there's like two ways to do it and they're both valid. Like, but yeah. if you start down one path then the other one becomes out of date and you can't, and you could switch in the middle but then it might become more expensive. Like, how do you deal mm -hmm. with that without having to get proposals past the threshold? Like, how do you do with right. project management is, is the question. Yeah, so um, basically any proposal in a, in a in a compound governance system is just a smart contract function. Um, typically when you're trying to fund something, it'll, it'll be in a ERC-20, which is the token standard on Ethereum, uh, to transfer a certain amount of tokens to an address. Um, and before the proposal passes, it is up to um, the proposal to, to basically do, like 
define the social contract. Um, and afterwards, whatever the governance is of that address is, is going to be in charge of project managing the, the proposal forward. So it could be a Gnosis multisig where you have several holders of the multisig who decide it could be another compound governance system, or it could be some other mechanism. It would be up to them at that point to decide that. So basically it's like, we're the big picture thinkers here, how it actually gets done. It's up to some other group that might have a totally different governance method. Um, with the exception of how it's, what's, what's outlined in the proposal, which right. is the social contract that gets validated by governance. Yeah. Okay. All right. So like, I guess I'm at the level of, all right, we're making it and we have a distributed team. How do we deal with, mm -hmm. there's, there's more than one way to skin a cat. There is. Yeah. Glenn, did you uh, want to add something to Christina's? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to up level something that Amit said in the chat, which was um, about macroeconomic analysis. This is something we desperately need. All of the stuff in radical markets and in the whole radical exchange stuff has all been micro mechanisms. We desperately need someone to like actually think about like, if everything were like cost, what would happen to finance? Or everything was salsa, what would happen to finance? If like you actually used quadratic funding to like be the way that most business were was funded, what would international trade look like? Because basically like the country would be, have a giant matching fund, but then like, what does international trade look like? That's like subsidies. And, and there's like all these like big questions about like, how does this actually work out on a macro scale that like nobody's worked through um, that I think would be like incredibly helpful if anyone wants to take those on. Glenn is available at Glenn at radicalexchange.org. Um, yeah, and I, I'd say that like I look at Gitcoin as a lot of in a lot of ways as a vessel of prototyping um, the ideas that come out of radical exchange. And so whoever's working on that and wants to see quadratic funding at scale and study the data, we have the data. Great. Well, uh, thank you, uh, thank you so much, uh, Kevin, for uh, for this uh, this great uh, uh, intro and uh, and uh, and you know, like to um, tell the story and and we'll definitely um, have you back on to uh, to see how it's going in, in a few months or a few weeks. So, totally. Uh, Thanks for we'll, having me. We'll follow that uh, quite closely. Um, so the second uh, topic, uh, the, um, uh, as, as you know, it is uh, Pride Month uh, uh, in June, and uh, uh, and so we wanted to uh, start the conversation because it's June second on uh, hearing uh, about um, some work some of you might have been doing uh, with or for the uh, LGBTQIA uh, communities uh, or um, uh, or subjects uh, like often linked to code and identity um, that uh, might uh, arise. Um, there, are, um, there was last year, uh, there was an amazing uh, uh, talk uh, and conversation uh, during Pride Month uh, 2020 between um, Audrey Tang and uh, Yuval Noah uh, Harari. Uh, that I really do recommend uh, to everybody. Let me put it in the chat for everybody to have. Um, that was really centered uh, around uh, themes of um, uh, really how our identities um, um, really handled uh, with code, with algorithm, uh, and, and really uh, going from, you know, like the joys that one can, uh, can find in finding uh, more like communities online uh, to share, um, you know, like um, questions uh, like identity uh, questions or uh, or any uh, any other um, concerns to like uh, the danger of uh, technological determinism and and how uh, technology knows uh, ourselves better uh, than we do and uh, and the conversation between the two are is extremely interesting in that sense because um, like Taiwan has been thinking a lot about the use of AI as um, a, a tool that is um, that is for um, like serving uh, the people and uh, and you know like so so making the code uh, pretty much LGBT uh, QIA and anybody like friendly um, so I wanted to uh, let uh, people. Um, um, 
like raise some uh, some uh, questions or uh, or projects they've heard or want would like to share. Uh, I think that's uh, uh, the moment uh, to do that. And if not, uh, or if uh, you want to mention some things in the chat, um, we uh, Hello. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I I recently read an article about in New York Times about uh, that co-op drivers co-op as an alternative to Uber and Ola. Uh, I think that uh, those of uh, those sorts of cooperatives should be like. Uh, promoted uh, to other governments that the state should um, actually fund and make those uh, cooperatives instead of like uh, simply leaving on the people to um, take up those chances, uh, take up those initiatives and do it uh, by themselves. And uh, I think that a uh, radical exchange community can uh, work with governments instead of uh, uh, to promote such ideas. Yeah, I mean, it would be great if you have a if you have a link uh, if you can uh, drop it in 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 the chat or uh, for uh, uh, for everybody. I think that's uh, um, definitely uh, useful. Like even just in terms of awareness and and reading more about civic code and how uh, it's you know code impacts like decisions on uh, uh, on things that you know on everybody's lives. And Harshit, like you had mentioned, like um, you wanted to talk about the role of fiction. Uh, I don't know if uh, if you still want to mention something about it and like the role of fiction in building a better future. I don't know if we have him on. Uh, maybe not. Ah, thank you for the link. Um, great. So I think I mean we're we're definitely gonna like we're opening the forum uh, today uh, to um, um, to raise these uh, these issues. Like talk more about um, uh, related projects and uh, and we'll definitely uh, be in touch in uh, uh, like during the months uh, to uh, uh, to share more uh, about this. Um, if there's no other comments um, for now, uh, I wanted to um, first see if there were any chapter updates um, that we wanted to anybody wanted to share uh, during the uh, the call. Reminder for everybody is that um, like there are uh, local chapters uh, everywhere uh, and uh, still a mix between high, like online, but. Uh, a lot of chapters are also reopening uh, in-person uh, meetups. Uh, you know, Nicolin mentioned in Barcelona that there were more things happening in um, in Paris as well. Uh, they're starting again, so it's quite exciting to uh, reconnect. Uh, but any any updates that I'm missing? All right, and Samile, uh, Angela, I can put you in uh, in touch with. Uh, the radical exchange chapter uh, in Bangalore. Uh, so uh, I know we also have a quite a, an exciting update from uh, radical exchange uh, voice. Um, so uh, we actually presented uh, radical for radical voting in general and uh, uh, radical exchange voice at a consensus uh, conference uh, last week, along with uh, Jen. Matt and uh, Alex, uh, and uh, it was a workshop. So we actually uh, got people to do a demo of quadratic voting uh, live, uh, which was quite exciting. Uh, and I do want to let Alex uh, give you a few more details about that and, and where we stand. And maybe we'll even play the trailer. <laughs> Alex? Thanks, Fanny. Yeah. Um... So yeah, it's been an exciting couple of weeks for our work on RxC Voice and on the uh, lightweight quadratic voting tool that we developed. Um, we had a great presentation at Consensus, which was focused on an interactive demo of that tool, which you can find at quadraticvote.radicalexchange.org. Um, we uh, that so just to explain what that app is it's it like i said it's like a lightweight quadratic voting app so it's intended to kind of educate through 
interactive demos about quadratic voting. So it's if if you want to, it's it's forked. By the way, I should mention from the Gitcoin project, um, quadraticvote.co. Uh, but we kind of put our own style on it, and we've been kind of making some uh, some adjustments to certain features as we see fit. So that tool is useful if you're interested in spinning up a quadratic vote uh, with your friends or with your coworkers or whatever to settle some kind of decision using quadratic voting. We also, after the interactive demo, we presented at consensus this uh, trailer that Fanny mentioned of RxC voice, which if we have time, we'll show you here as well. Um, because we are currently, as many of you know, in the middle of sort of dog fooding RxC voice uh, with this, uh, what we're calling the beta launch, uh, where we're um, bringing the broader radical exchange community into the process of, pro of deciding which activities the Radical Exchange Foundation should prioritize over the next year. Um, so many of you have been participating in that, which uh, we really appreciate your participation and your feedback. And um, for those of you who who didn't know that was going on, um, we uh, we're we're keeping this we're as is, we're trying to keep this as inclusive as possible. Um, so the way that we'll do this, with the way that we did it this time, and the way that we'll continue to do it in the future is we'll always have an open invitation to this process. So if you didn't catch it this time, next time, keep your eye out for uh, when we sort of publicize the event ahead of time. And we accept, we, we uh, add anybody who asks to be, and anybody who asks to participate, we add to the process. So, you know, if you, if you all you have to do is ask and you shall receive. Um, so did we wanna show the trailer or did, have a little q and a or what's the i don't know angela you produced it so should i i shared it in the in the chat but let me know if you want me or or if uh, if matt you want to play it because i don't have sharing um right now up to you guys sure we can end with uh is that the one that doesn't have any uh is the quick one <laughs> yeah okay yeah, definitely show it. I think that that's a good way to end the meeting. All right, I'm the co-host. Um, all right, let me play it. Sound on, people. Wait, I first need to share. Hey! All right, one second. All right. Can you see my screen and hear it?
All right. So I think it deserves some explanation, but that was like just to wake you up and you know some like you know who made voting fun, I guess. Angela did. So thank you, uh, Angela, for uh, for the trailer. But uh, Matt, uh, Jen, or Alex, if you want to give a, a bit more details, or uh, or if you anybody has questions, uh, uh, please. Uh, There's a lot more to say. Happy to answer any questions about um, about the whole system. There's a lot of kind of thinking that went into different different elements of it, um, and uh, some of which are, I think, kind of get to the core of uh, what we were talking about earlier in terms of kind of balancing actually, you know, uh, human touch and discretion with with uh, uh, you know non discretionary like automated elements so um um yeah uh sami yeah hey uh, hey matt um so my question is just for a crowd of people or for, for any meaningful set of people uh, to be able to use this voting system they'll have to understand uh, a lot of primitive concepts right it's uh, it's it's not uh, it's not self explanatory so what would be the most efficient way to teach a crowd of people how this works or what's going on here so that they can go ahead and put a meaningful vote in was the most efficient way to onboard them. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think it's a super important point. I mean, there are, um, you, you know, I don't think there's any way around at, at this stage, you know, um, people kind of reading some documentation and um, you know, watching a, a video or two to get a sense of what, what quadratic voting is um, and how it works and, and how the different stages of the radical exchange voice process uh, fit together. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a learning curve and I think we'll, we're going to continue to, you know, refine our, our educational materials and, and documentation to, you know, like walk walk people through it in a uh, in a clearer way. Um, uh, but yeah, totally agree. It's a it's a point that that Matt frequently reminds me of anyway. That um, it's a it, it's important to keep in mind that as if if our systems that we're designing can be even as easy as current systems, if we ex if we accept that their the mechanism design is better in some way, then if it gets even as easy, we're already reaping the benefits, right? Because it's and and I just point that out because there's many things about um, current one person one vote systems that you know have a have a steep learning curve and that are inaccessible at times um so it's just, I, I i like it's important to keep that in mind as well um as we continue to refine things they don't have to be perfect but they have to be we have to design them with the goal of accessibility another um oh, sorry uh, just another quick little dimension here is that you know it's interesting to think about what motivates people to learn things, to learn about new systems and stuff. And, and it tends to be uh, incentives, you know? So if, if there's an, uh, an important decision that's being made, um, people have um, uh, more reason or people have sort of a, you know, a, a carrot pulling them to invest a little bit of time to, to learn about something. So I think that um, that, yeah, I mean, b building towards m more and more like meaningful, relevant uh, um, use cases uh, is is also important to the education process. Um, so, Sabo, you had your hand raised. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so right now with the beta uh, launch, we're in between stages. We're in between like the deliberation and the election. And I was wondering how how are you like curating the the proposals that were done in the deliberation stage to you know for them to become proposals in the election stage because there were a lot of of opinions that were shared in the in the deliberation stage on polis 
I was wondering, how are you creating the proposals from that? That's a, that's a really great question. Um, and one that we're taking very seriously because it's such a crucial part of the part of the process that could easily, you know, be a, a, an anti-democratic pitfall in what we intend to be a decentralized process. Um, because obviously, you know, there is some, uh, there's a curation process that has to happen between the polis conversation and the election so that we can ensure that what we are voting on in the in the election part is a coherent ballot where all of the proposals are clear concise and they trade off of one they trade off of one another in a clear way um, but so to answer your question the way that we're doing that is we're we are we're accepting all of the comments from the uh, polis conversation. And so that's just to say that we're not, we don't have any cutoff for like this percentage of people had to agree with the comments for it to make it to the ballot. We're just accepting all of them outright. Um, but then what we're doing is we're going through them one by one and we're trying to pull out what's the, is, is there a clear action that this comment is suggesting that the Radical Exchange Foundation take? Um, and it doesn't even have to, you know, if, if it, if it's clearly implied, if an action is clearly implied, it doesn't have, even necessarily have to be explicit. We're not going to toss comments out on that basis. Um, but so, so all we're trying to incorporate the ideas from every single comment on the ballot in some way, the only ones that aren't making it to the ballot are ones that there's really no clear action implied. Um, and then the only other thing that we're changing other than, you know, and, and, and we're trying to, we're, we're making a, like a very good faith effort to stay as close to the language in the original language in the comments as possible. Um, and Patrick Connolly from the Polis community sent us a, a really interesting and well reasoned argument for why that's so important recently. Um, because not only does you know changing the language of a comment um, based on our interpretation of it invite bias into the system, it also removes important context for like community sense making of issues. Um, so we're trying to stay as close to the like original language of each comment as possible, um, and the only. The, the, the only other consideration we're taking uh, uh, for ch like possible changes from the conversation to the ballot is to consolidate comments that seem to suggest the same clear action for the Radical Exchange Foundation, because so certain comments might suggest the same action or, or imply the same action. And the difference between them is that they either that they're like different formulations of the same idea or that they give different reasoning to support that proposal um, and, and so on. So in cases like that, we're doing the best we can to um, take comments that suggest the same clear action, consolidate them into one proposal that um, incorporates all the ideas from all the different formulations. Um, does that, and so then we are and then, publish, we're gonna publish a, a document where we, where we specify each of these decisions that we made as clearly and explicitly as possible so that everybody can, ref, as they're looking at the ballot, they can refer not only to the original text of the comments in the polis report that's also published, but also to this in this document, see the actual changes we made and our justifications for those changes. Um, and they can use both of those documents to inform their decision about whether or not to support the ballot ratification proposal.
Um, I see Christina raised her hand. Uh, uh, I think it's going to be the last question. I put in the chat like the uh, the email for uh, to reach out to Alex. Uh, really, any comment, uh, idea, like really, uh, like any help is really appreciated. Like it's voice at radicalexchange.org. Um, and so the last question for Christina. So my last question, one which I discussed with Patrick. Um, cause I found Patrick through Polis was why didn't you see the, um, I understand why you didn't see the poll, but then since I noticed that I'm also the one that put, Hmm, which was a very disagreed upon comment and also like the first five or 10 statements. So like, just because I was there first, I, I was able to see it essentially, um, was that intended or no? That's a good point. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's, you know, that's one of the areas that we're going to rethink as we move out of this first major experiment with this tool. Um, so that that's really helpful feedback because, and I think there it's, un, it's not exactly clear what the answer to that should be. Cause on the one hand, um, I, cause you know, on, on the one hand, we don't want to lead the conversation, right. Cause it's supposed to be decentralized. And so maybe it, there's too much power to the people who seed the conversation, but then also like, as you are pointing out that that power has to go to someone. So it's either going to be yeah, us or just randomly the first person who participates. So that, that's a, that's a really interesting point. And I think that's the, the answer isn't, isn't clear quite yet. Like we're going to have to think about that further. So I'm just being mindful. Uh, thank you, uh, 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 Christina. Uh, I just being mindful as we're over time. So I just want to make sure uh, we uh, we keep it to an hour. A lot of things to uh, discuss. One thing I'm going to say is that uh, we are trying to uh, get a lot of the conversations like this, uh, especially on voice or, or, or specific subjects to uh, Discord. And uh, I'm going to put the link uh, and, and hope you guys uh, join us on Discord to really have more of a than like once a month, you know, a um, uh, discussion on all of that. Um, Jen, Matt, any last word for, for today? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for everyone for joining. All right. Thank you, everybody, and have a, a good rest of your day. All right. Okay. Bye.